welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees, and on each episode, I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And on this episode, we are going to explore some eerie accounts of good old death omens. Death omens, supernatural signs that death is coming for you, or if not you personally, somebody that you know, or somebody nearby. Terrifying warnings of some imminent misfortune that is going to befall someone in the vicinity. And in what I think is a first for this podcast, probably a first for any podcast, we are going to be looking at the curious case of the ghost of a grave. The ghost of a grave. All of which, and much more, will be explained very, very soon. And so, to begin at the beginning. And one of the most popular forms of a death omen in Wales, one of the most common, you could say, is the corpse candle. I've spoken about corpse candles many a time on this podcast. They are floating lights that resemble the flame of a candle. And to see one when out and about was never a good sign. And while accounts of people encountering these lights usually take place at night and usually take place outside, that is not always the case. And there are cases of these corpse candles not following people down dark alleyways at the witching hour, but instead entering people's homes. These lights can enter your home, which must be extra scary. You can't run away from these things anymore. They will follow you wherever you are. And folklore tells us that sometimes a corpse candle was seen coming into the chamber of the person about to die. So if somebody was on their deathbed at home or in somebody else's home, people have reported seeing these strange lights floating into their houses and then into their rooms, which is a rather unsubtle way of saying that they will not be with us much longer. These are death omens. They are floating into the rooms of people who clearly will not be here much longer. These lights are saying, effectively, the end is nigh. And we're told that in one case, a woman who was a native of Gwynvy in Carmarthenshire said that when her child was dying, she took particular notice of a pale bluish light coming in through the window and standing over the bed. And the folklorist who was given that description some 100 years ago or so now claims that they were also given several other person's accounts saying things of this kind. So this was not a one-off. A number of people encountered these strange lights, these pale bluish lights, although the colour could change, that floated into rooms and signalled death. Now, this next account of a corpse candle in the community comes to us courtesy of a Mr. Joseph Davis of Clindarwen in Pembrokeshire, who wrote in 1901 that, to quote, it happened not many miles from Tenby, where a certain young schoolmistress lodged at a farmhouse, where she was very happy in every respect. So it starts well, she lives in this farmhouse just outside Tenby, and she is very happy, until one night, after retiring to bed, and the lights were turned out, and she was lying there in darkness, she suddenly noticed a peculiar greyish light, like a star, moving towards the foot of her bed from the doorway. So in this account, we've got a greyish light rather than a bluish light. And there is a theory that the colour of the light could reflect the identity of the person or the persons who was going to die. So bright, colourful lights might suggest young people, for example. Maybe dark, duller lights might suggest older people and so on and so forth. But to continue, this light, this greyish light, came to a standstill by her bed and gently lowered to her feet. Almost paralysed with fear, she called with all her strength for help, and in a few minutes, the whole of the household were together in that room, listening in amazement to the frightened girl's story. And all sorts of means were used to pacify her and to induce her to go to sleep, but without avail.' 
She was so terrified, whatever they did, they could not calm her down. She would not stay in that room for the world, and her bed had to be removed and fixed on a temporary bedstead in the room where the mistress slept. So, all in all, that sounds like a terrifying experience. A strange light floated down her body from her head to her toes, and as a result, she had no choice, or they had no choice, but to move her from one bedroom to the other one, to sleep in the same room as her mistress. And I should just clarify the language there. When they say her bed had to be removed, they don't mean the bedstead itself. They mean the person was relocated to sleep elsewhere, but the physical bed was left behind. There was no furniture removal going on or anything. But after the events of that night, the story soon spread abroad, as I'm sure you can imagine the servants and whoever else was about were soon gossiping about those events. They whispered about it in hushed tones, and it was quickly the talk of the town. Some made light of it, and some looked serious. But whether they believed it or not, all of them tried to get the young lady to shake off all thoughts of it, but to no purpose. Let them laugh or chaff. She bore the same sad expression and said something would certainly follow to clear up the mystery. So here again, we have this belief that as a result of seeing this strange light, somebody was going to die. This woman was under no doubt this must be a death omen, this must be a corpse candle. It was just a case now of deciphering that message. Who exactly was going to die? What did this grey light mean? Well, you'll be glad to know you're about to find out, because we are nearing the end of the story. And about six weeks or so had passed since these events. And one night, the mistress, who was a strong, healthy woman, suddenly took ill, and she unexpectedly died. The young schoolmistress happened at the time to be away on her holidays, and on hearing of the sad news, she hurried back to attend the funeral. When she arrived at the house, she was taken upstairs to see the body, and she again became almost paralysed on finding that the corpse had been laid out on the spare bedstead, on the very spot where she had, six weeks previously, pointed out where the light had lowered and disappeared. No one had thought of the incident until reminded of it by the girl. The only reason the body had been laid out in that spot was purely for convenience. It was an empty bed, it wasn't being used, let's put it in the spare bedstead. No one ever thought of the young lady's fright until she now pointed it out herself. So, to recap quickly, the mistress has died. Her body has been put in waiting in this bed because it's an empty bed. But of course, we know the reason nobody is using it is because the schoolmistress, so she says, saw a corpse candle, a canoeth corf, hovering over a body. Now, in that case, it was hovering over a living body. It was her own body. But now the bed was occupied by the body that we can presume it was prophesizing the death of. And, because we're not quite done yet with that tale, as an aftermath to this tale, our narrator, good old Mr. Joseph Davis, tells us that, after that, it can be easily imagined the whole neighbourhood became convinced that there was something in it after all. And the old superstition got strengthened in the minds of the young people, that people still talk about it to the present day. Now, again, of course, this was written some 100 years ago, but nevertheless, at the turn of the 20th century, the start of a new age of reason and rationality, belief in corpse candles was, in this lovely part of Pembrokeshire, seemingly on the rise, thanks to this convincing and chilling account of a corpse candle that emerged from just outside of Tenby. 
Now, moving on to our second strange account, even stranger accounts, save the best for last, as they always say. And this one isn't so much a premonition of death, but it's the premonition of something associated with death. And and, and I'm going to purposely be a bit vague here because I don't want to spoil the spooky surprises that are coming up. So just bear with me. I promise you all will be revealed and it will all be worth it. And this tale is described as a remarkable instance of second sight and it was contributed by a Mr. John Pavin Phillips to the local press so this was printed in the newspapers in 1858 and the events he is about to describe happened to him this is a first-hand account in the year of our Lord 1818 when after many years absence he had just returned home to Pembrokeshire. We're back in Pembrokeshire again. And he tells us that a few days after my arrival, I took a walk one morning in the yard of one of our parish churches, through which there is a right of way for pedestrians. So that's a good start. We already know that Mr. Phillips is not a trespasser. He is a good Christian that walks through parish churches where there is a right of way for pedestrians. He is very mindful of the laws of roaming. And he tells us that my object was a twofold one. Firstly, to enjoy the magnificent prospect visible from that portion. And secondly, to see whether any of my friends or acquaintances who had died during my absence were buried in the locality. So, this good start continues. He is going to the church for two reasons. Firstly, to enjoy the view, a great reason to go to church. And secondly, and I love this detail, to read the headstones to see if anyone that he knew personally had died while he was away. And kids nowadays have no idea how easy they've got it finding out these things via social media. Back in the good old days, back in the early, early days of newspapers even, before you could presumably just pick up a copy easily and check who had passed away, this poor man had to walk to churchyards and read the inscriptions on gravestones to find out which of his friends were no longer with us. And to continue, he tells us that after gazing around for a short time, I sauntered on. Another nice little detail, if he's sauntering, that suggests he didn't find out too much bad news. There was nothing that upset him and broke his sauntering. And he continues by telling us that, as I was looking at one tombstone and then another, my attention was arrested by an altar tomb. An altar tomb, which, if you, if you aren't familiar with the name, an altar tomb is effectively a fancy tomb. It looks like the tomb of somebody with a little bit of cash to splash with decorations and its box shape, almost like a, like a rectangle that sticks out of the ground. And this altar tomb was enclosed within an iron railing. So, like I said, very posh. Quite a grand grave this time. An altar tomb that was enclosed within an iron railing. And he continues, I walked up to it and read an inscription which informed me that it was in memory of Colonel Blank. The, the name has purposely been left out here. This is, again, a real life story. So the name has been hidden, presumably, for that reason. But for the purposes of this story, I don't want to keep saying Colonel Blank. He hasn't got a name. So I'm going to give him a name and we're going to call him Llewellyn. A nice, good, honest Welsh name. So for the purposes of this story, Colonel Llewellyn. And this Colonel Llewellyn, we are told, had been the assistant poor law commissioner for South Wales. So quite an important job. And while on one of his tours of inspection, he was seized by apoplexy in the workhouse of my native town. And by my native town, of course, I mean his native town, the narrator's native town. I don't mean mine as in Port Talbot, but it was there in his native town that he had this seizure in the workplace and died in a few hours. Hours. And this sudden death, the narrator tells us, was suggested in my mind as I read the inscription on the tomb. So these details of how this man died and where were suggested to his mind as he read the inscription on the tomb. Because it goes without saying, but this man has been away for a good few years now. He wasn't there at the time of the death 
But as he reads this tomb, he gets some kind of recollection that maybe he'd read about it in the press or somewhere beforehand. But by seeing this object, it's in a way, it's jogged his memory. It's made him remember something he didn't even realise he knew was in his brain. And he tells us that not being acquainted with the late Colonel Llewellyn and never having seen him, the circumstances of his sudden demise had long passed from my memory and were only revived by thus viewing his tomb. So, to recap quickly, he's found this grave, this very ornate fancy grave of a Colonel Llewellyn. Somebody he did not know personally, so he's not, again, overly upset. He's still sauntering, we can assume. But he was seemingly somebody he knew by name. And having seen the tomb and having read the inscription and all the rest of it, he now was perfectly aware of how this man had died. And to return to the story, and he tells us that I then passed on and shortly afterwards returned home. On my arrival, my father asked me in what direction I had been walking, and I replied in blank churchyard. Again, the location has been hidden because these are real places, real people, real events. In blank churchyard, looking at the tombs, and among others, I have seen the tomb of Colonel Llewellyn, who died in the workhouse. That, replied my father, is impossible as there is no tomb erected over Colonel Llewellyn's grave. At this remark, I laughed. My dear father, said I, you want to persuade me that I cannot read. I was not aware that Colonel Llewellyn was buried in the churchyard and was only informed of the fact by reading the inscription on the tomb. To which his father replied, whatever you might say to the contrary, what I tell you is true. There is no tomb over Colonel Llewellyn's grave. Astounded by the reiteration of the statement, as soon as I had dined, I returned to the churchyard and again inspected all the tombs having railings around them. This one was quite easy to identify because of the railings and found that my father was right. So, Having been told by his father that there was no way he could know all this information about the colonel, having read the inscription on his grave because there was no inscription, in fact, there was no tomb, there was no nothing, he went back to the churchyard to check his senses, and not only was there no tomb bearing the name Colonel Llewellyn, but there was no tomb at all. No tomb that corresponded in appearance with the one he had seen earlier. So not only had he got the wrong name, the entire thing didn't exist. But he tells us that being unwilling to credit the evidence of his own senses, he went to the cottage of what he describes as an old acquaintance of my boyhood who lived outside of the churchyard gate, so just nearby, and asked her to show the place where Colonel Llewellyn laid buried. And he says that she took me to the spot which was a green mound, undistinguished in appearance from the surrounding graves. So the place, the spot where Colonel Llewellyn was seemingly buried, is the total opposite to this grand ornate railing tomb that he had seen. In fact, it was a plain green mound of earth. And he finishes by saying, nearly two years subsequent to this occurrence, surviving relatives erected an altar tomb with a railing around it over the last resting place of Colonel Llewellyn, there on that mound. And it was, as nearly as I could remember, an exact reproduction of the memorial I saw in my daydream. He describes it as a daydream. And he ends this report with a quote that 99.99999% of people writing about ghosts in Victorian newspapers use, it was almost compulsory for every ghost article to contain these words at some point. But he finishes by saying, Verily, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophy. And that brings us to the end of the second of our two tales in which we didn't have a premonition of a death as in the earlier account. The man was already dead and buried. That part we can be certain of. But we do get a premonition of his future monument. 
of the permanent marker that will tell the world the story of Colonel Llewellyn, a phantom grave, a phantom tomb that stood as testament to the man who lost his life in the workhouse and how one man somehow managed to get a glimpse of his permanent memorial before his family had even commissioned it. And on that bizarre, confusing, grave-digging note, we have reached the end of another episode of the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. And it's always nice to end with a, a baffling mystery, something for you to think about long after this episode has finished. And if you enjoyed this confusing episode and you haven't already, please consider pressing the subscribe button. And if you really enjoyed it, you can like it, you can rate it, you can tell your friends about it. And if you really, really liked it, you can support the podcast by treating me to a coffee via my website, which helps keep this thing on the air. If you'd like more Ghosts and Folklore, you can follow me on social media. And as well as this podcast, I've also written a number of books about similar weird and wonderful subjects, which are available from all good bookshops offline and on. And as always, support your local bookshop wherever possible. I'm sure they can order copies in if you ask them nicely. All of which just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian Amrando. I've been Mark Royce. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast beaming to you from Wales to the world. And remember, if you do find yourself sauntering through a graveyard and a particularly ornate grave catches your eye, take a good look at the inscription, because who knows, it might not be there much longer. Until next time, no star. Mm-hmm.